the, the second uh, of our uh, talks devoted to the ideas and uh, the theories, if you like, of prudence um, in, in today's uh, conference. It's my tremendous pleasure to uh, welcome Vera Keller. Um, Vera Keller is, uh, teaches at uh, University of Oregon, uh, where she's primarily a historian of science of early modern Europe. She's currently co-investigator with Anne-Marie Rose um, on the AHRC-funded project Collective Wisdom, Collecting in, early modern, in the Early Modern Academy. Vera is the author of many articles, uh, in addition to uh, her monograph, Knowledge and the Public Interest, 1575 to 1725, uh, that came out from Cambridge in 2015, and uh, about to appear, <laughs> um, and much anticipated, her book, The Interlopers, Cornelis Drebbel, 1572 to 1633, an early Stuart science on the world stage. And her latest book project, The Experimental Century, Curating the Early German Enlightenment, explores um, intertwined reform projects of Johann Daniel Mayor and Daniel Georg Morhof for the museum and library. So who better <laughs> than to introduce another aspect of prudence and techno. Welcome, Vera. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to the Bar Graduate Center. And thank you also to those great remarks from Peter that started us off. Um, I hope we can return to that question about the library and the museum later today. Um, and to um, Andrew's remarks, as well as to Mark. It's not the first time Mark and I have shared a session. And as usual, there's going to be great synergy between our talks. So looking forward to that. So my talk today addresses a body of writings little read by historians of science or of art, cameralist, political, and economic thought. With few exceptions, notably Pamela Smith and her work on Johann Joachim Becher, Alex Cooper and her studies of territoriality and natural history, and Lisbeth Kerner's analysis of Linnaeus, historians of science have paid surprisingly little attention to cameralism, even though the modern scientific disciplines were established in German universities as part of the cameralist sciences and then exported from there to the US and elsewhere. This body of, body of thought compiled, compiled by servants of the Kammer or fiscal administration over the 17th and 18th centuries, I believe has much to tell us about large scale changes in the history of knowledge, including the history of collecting in Central Europe. And the core of this change lies in notions of prudence and its relationship to techne. As I have argued in my book, Knowledge and the Public Interest, a new practical, transformative, and anti-systematic form of reasoning of state grew from legal and courtly contexts in the late 16th century, transforming learned cultures and the management of knowledge by reframing learned goals in terms of the fulfillment of human interests and passions, thus undermining that distinction, that Aristotelian distinction that Andrew has laid out between the rational and the appetitive. Prudence itself was conceptualized as the reason of state. And this period notion of the advancement of learning, I argue there, was drawn from political thinking, beginning with the work of lawyers like Guido Panciaroli, Francis Bacon, and Jacob Bornitz, and only after a century spreading to universities themselves. While Pamela and others have increasingly emphasized the role of artisans in the development of experimentalism and empiricism, it was Cameralist writers and their patrons who early on valued artisanal knowledge, formalized its study, and shepherded techne into academic environments. A case in point is Jakob Bornitz, a founding Cameralist writer, who although far from a household name today, left an enduring imprint on Cameralist thinking about the mechanical arts. I've discussed Bornitz before in a variety of publications, but today I'll focus more on the role of the Kunstkammer in his thinking. The Kunstkammer poses challenges for fiscal writers. On the one hand, it bears witness to the esteem with which mechanical arts were held by noblemen, but, and thus supporting Bornitz's arguments about the centrality of craft to the state. On the other hand, it was an enormous drain on the treasury with no immediate apparent utility. So my talk today, after introducing Bornitz and the reason of state and the special political way he established to talk about nature, will take us through two of his main ideas about how to manage crafts for the good of the state, the role of transplanting both nature and crafts and the valuation of techniques of mimesis and artificiality. Then I will look at how those ideas play out in the context of the Kunstkammer and conclude by pointing to Bornitz's influence in later works. 
So according to his own account, um, published in, posthumously in 1626, Bornitz, who was Lutheran, was born in Torgau, but after studies and travel, moved to Upper Lusatia, where by 1608 he served as advocate for the imperial treasury and as an imperial counselor. His work brought him off into Prague, where he counted Kepler among his friends and noted meeting artists like Bartholomew Sprenger. When his region became engulfed in the opening salvos of the Thirty Years' War, he retreated to an academic stay in Frankfurt on the Oder in 1621, where he penned his greatest work, On a Sufficiency of Things, in the course of one month, he says, in 1622, and it was published in 1625. This work represents the culmination of many prior shorter works, where he adumbrated his ideas, beginning with his discourse, political discourse, on acquiring political prudence of 16 over 2 that was reprinted twice. And continuing on through works on coins, on rewards, on the treasury, etc. On acquiring political prudence marked the introduction of Giovanni Botero's anti Machiavellian uh, 1589 version of the reason of state into German speaking lands. Botero and other similar political writers, such as the anonymously published collection, the Tesoro Politico, also 1589, um, relied upon diplomatic accounts or relazioni of various lands, basing economic strategy on the comparative study of advantages and disadvantages, including natural resources and industries, that could be manipulated in various ways. So this was about economic rather than um, um, military um, technique. Botero had already discussed the state as a work of art and the prince as an artist who attempted to transform the matter of the state in various artificial ways. And Bornitz stressed this metamorphic potential of the reason of state even more in his work on political prudence, where he adumbrated many of the core principles drawn from legal texts that would continue to structure his thinking, such as the ancient legal idea, which we see also in Guido Panciaroli, that nature hurries to give forth new forms. This quotation ultimately derived from Justinian and allowed for the creation of new laws to fit new situations. It is one example of a legal and political view of nature that is at odds with a natural philosophical one. While we often assume that pre-modern naturalists shared a notion of static order, of a divine chain of being to which nothing was added and nothing was taken away, and we think that the idea of extinction did not exist in this period, this is not true. The, this principle affirmed that nature continuously gave rise to new things, and likewise, Bornitz and others point out, many things could be lost as well. This pertained as much to human interventions and inventions as it did to natural kinds. Such a view of the world in flux meant that little could be predetermined, everything had to be studied empirically rather than abstractly, according to its current situation, and action had to be fitted to the appropriate situation. And this is the essence of prudence in Bornitz's context. It shares many of those similar qualities, such as contingency and suiting action to the situation that we have already heard about. His political maxims appear in a charming and popular emblem book that remained long in print, so coming out in six editions, the first one quite posthumously in 1638, he having died in 1625. Um, so, for instance, this notion that nature always gives out new forms was shown through the image of one of the well-known women-to-men transsexuals. As the device explains, equi sponsa fuit yam tibi sponsus erit, your wife might suddenly become your husband. <laughs> the idea that knowledge had to be empirical, risk-taking, and probabilistic was shown through the figure of miners prizing jewels that had to be located through material effort and could not be predetermined through abstract reason, non omnium ratio constat. Bornitz supported alchemical views of the superiority of art to nature, which could be transformed and perfected through processes like distillation, showing that ars superat naturam, that art surpasses nature, or through processes such as the making of glass from such rude materials as ash and sand. For Bornitz, the figure who affected these transformations for the state as a whole was the politician. As he asserted several times, the politician can be defined as the artisan for the perfecting of republics. Here, Bornitz stressed an alchemical transmutatory potential. Botero had defined the reason of state as the knowledge of means fit to conserve, uh, found, conserve, and expand a dominion. And Bornitz, uh, key to this idea and taken up by Bornitz of this notion of expanding a dominion was the idea that territory did not have to be expanded militarily through conquest. It could be expanded internally through the growth and population, the cultivation of crafts, and the attraction of bullion into the realm. And within the political debates of the period, oh, 
I'm sorry, that's me. <laughs> uh, within the political debates of the period, uh, this was the anti-Machiavelli notion, the idea that we're going to further um, economic development rather than um, uh, military aggression. Sorry. Um, but Vernon takes this further, defining the role of the politician as founding, conserving, expanding, and curing, and mutating. <laughs> In Bornes' German transformation of Otero, we see the explicit policy supporting Rudolf von Prague that Thomas Acosta Kaufmann has established. Bornes, who dedicated works to both Rudolf and later Ferdinand II, was careful to make this clear by transforming one of Rudolf's favorite artistic themes without Ceres and Bacchus, Venus Freezes, the subject of this work by Hendrik Holtzius, into a political statement without Ceres and Bacchus, society freezes. And I haven't seen anyone else say that. Without nourishment, we cannot function, and thus the cultivation of material life was the first step in politics. Crafts were the foundation of the state, according to Bornitz, and craftspeople some of the state's most important members. All followers of Otero supported the importance of crafts. However, predecessors, such as Hippolyte von Colley's Prince of 1595, offer an example of the amount of attention they previously received. Colley devoted a scant five pages to crafts, and Bornitz, by contrast, spent over 200 pages discussing an enormous range, and the chapter index that I have passed around on your handout will give you some indication. Bornitz sets the study in a practical political framework. His epigraph for the work was another of his favorite legal quotations, this time from Martian, every art is capable of improvement. So speaking about change in the arts, just as that other quotation from Justinian speaks about change in nature, he often pairs the two quotations. Bornitz identified the study of changing arts as part of legal and practice. As he wrote, he began collecting this material for this work almost at the beginning of his own studies as a young man, mostly informed by conversations with experienced artisans. He could never get enough of their ingenious works, even now. In his travels from his student days in England, France, Italy, and Germany, he curiously investigated all sorts of details of crafts, thinking that this also was a part of political study. Bornitz's written sources are extremely eclectic and often vernacular, drawing often on the books of secrets tradition, illustrating how secrets of art and nature intersected with secrets of empire that was the politician's craft, as well as history, many alchemical works, proverbs, ballads, and practical texts such as cookbooks. For instance, he cites Anna Wecker more than once in her cookbook, even holding up her text as proof that art, art such as cooking could be written about according to certain rules, Perhaps politics could as well. Despite his penchant for diagrammatic charts, a trait he shares with Malaeus and Kierkegaard and everyone else of the period, he refused to overly methodize his style of writing again and again, distinguishing between how he would discuss a topic and how others might. Thus, for example, he says, my proposal isn't for a precise number and identification of minerals about which the chemists and the philosophers bitterly fight, but just to indicate them in a popular way for the sake of necessity and public utility so that everyone might have the same reference. I give a couple of more examples where he makes the same points. Uh, also on color making, he says, here I don't treat the nature and species of colors like the natural philosophers do, but only for the sake of the use of others since the techniques which make colors may be missing in their public. But how the mixture and variety is made by nature is still being fought about among the natural philosophers and the chemists. Artisans certainly are skilled at mixing and tempering in many ways. The pigments for pictures and dyes obviously led by reason and experience through use. So he's much preferring his popular way of talking about this topic drawn from his conversations with artists themselves rather than the debates going on among the natural philosophers. Or on metals. He says, I have proceeded according to the popular order in the division of metals. For what the metals are as of now, and whether daily new ones arise and old ones fade away, the chemists and philosophers dispute, see Berdeus. For it is one thing to discuss metals natural philosophically, and another to do so medically, or chemically, or politically, or hieroglyphically. So this pragmatic discussion of nature allows him to break away from preordained systematic views, developing empirical and metamorphic alternatives. For example, according to the planetary system of the metals, which I'm showing here at the figure from an album or quorum inscription by the Hungarian alchemist Johannes Manfi Hunyadi. There were seven metals corresponding to seven planets and seven colors 
developed into an extensive system. However, Bornitz cited Jean Bordeaux from the mid-16th century to argue that there are far more than seven metals. What about steel or bismuth or other metals? What about the rizma of the Turks? Why does the sun not produce gold equally everywhere if gold and the sun are united? How can gold be found both in cold and hot climes like Germany and India? So we cannot depend upon this abstract system of seven metals to, in order to know about um, metals. And if not based on a universal static system, metals can also see to, seem to be come and go, fitting Bornitz's overall view of constant change in nature. For example, the famous electrum of the ancients, according to Bornitz, was no longer found in nature, but could be made artificially. Likewise, another metal, according to Georg Agricola, whom he quotes, a type of bismuth, was not found in nature in ancient times, but had recently begun to appear. This constant change in nature was where political advantage lay. If both nature and art were not static, then neither were the powers of the state. If the politician could manipulate change in ways that might transform or perfect the state. The world should be surveyed for parts of nature and of craft that might be transplanted to one's own region. For instance, and he has many examples of this, all those new American medicaments recently discussed by Johannes Wittich in 1589, such as sassafras, sarsaprilla, or kidney wood, lignum nephriticum, should be tried out in Germany. Wittich, in a work dedicated to a group of barber surgeons in Thuringia, had drawn his account from the Spanish physician Nicolas Menardes, um, where Menardes, um, who is eagerly collecting on the ports of Seville information coming from the New World, um, writes about the qualities of kidney wood. They take the wood and make slices of it as thin as possible and not very large and place them in clear spring water. And they leave them all the time. The water lasts for drinking. And half an hour after the wood is put in, the water begins to take a very pale blue color and becomes bluer the longer it stays, though the wood is of a white color. It's one of the amazing secrets of nature that Monardus promises to give in his book. And he, um, we also have, of course, accounts of this from the Florentine Codex, where kidney wood is called coatle and is described as a medicine that makes the water blue color and its juice is medicinal for the urine. And this is the kidney wood being chopped up um, into pieces over there. So, um, uh, Wittich did further experiment on kidney wood, as my partner and I did here in our solution of kidney wood in potash, um, the Menardes did, distinguishing, for example, between two different types of kidney wood, one fluorescing blue and the other blue and yellow, allowing one to distinguish between the real American medicament and the false alternative that was beginning to flood the markets. This was precisely the form of global survey and hands-on experimentation that the politician needed to cultivate if he hoped to transmute his state through the transplantation of art and nature. But due to his focus on money-making, Bornitz was not only interested in material practices that allowed one to distinguish fakes. He, in fact, valued fakery, noting among the types of arts imaginary or fictitious ones which imitate the truth of things through simulacra, which he says in a republic is legal, profitable, and pleasant, as long as it is done without fraud. For these arts thus imitate nature, and often through manual artifice or industry they surpass her. He identifies, for example, gem making and color making as among these, what he calls imaginary arts, writing, because art often surpasses nature with a bit of common sense, you can understand in what way they are brought into artificial forms. These are arts that are not meant to deceive and pass as precious materials, but rather to imitate and then surpass nature, as the viewer should be able to understand. Bornitz did discuss many actual precious items that one might see in Prague or other courts, such as polished jasper and multicolored marbles, yet fake versions of these materials might be an even better investment for the court. Speaking of fake woods, he wondered, what thing has human nature, eager for novelty and gain, not attempted to emulate? He praised the industry of color making, in particular, as of great profit for a state, for often an ugly thing can be, great, be made great just through slapping on some color. Fakery, coupled with the profit motive, thus brings us to the edge of respectability in the arts. Yet, Bornitz was eager to establish that many noblemen did value craft, as one could see in the many wonderful uh, chambers of artifice or Kunstkammern, as he mentions, or from noblemen who were in fact artists themselves, such as Georg von Flug, a counselor of the Elector of Saxony, about whom I know little. If any of you know more, please enlighten me. Um, whom Bornitz identifies as one of his patrons. 
and who might easily compete with many artisans in their own craft. Bornitz, as here, refers to the Kunstklammer glowingly in several chapters. For instance, in his discussion of spheres and globes, he writes, you can see also the princes and noblemen take pleasure in the variety and elegance of such instruments in their Kunstkammer, made from bronze, gold, and silver, for it is proper that they should love, cultivate, and care for any work of ingenuity or mechanical device. Those who are experienced in the imperial court know with what great expenses the rare instruments of the noble Tycho Brahe, with the support of Emperor Rudolf, were made. However, in one chapter, Bornitz cannot avoid mentioning some of the problematic aspects of the Kunstkammer. Chapter 108 explores ingenious but useless arts, whose utility and profit to the state were nil, but which served more as a game and to show off one's ingenium. He cited from several sermons, vernacular sermons, in which preachers railed against a long list of ridiculous and useless objects seen in contemporary kunstkammers, like many figures, for example, for example, carved in a cherry pit. This section sits at odds with the rest of the work, which celebrated ingenious objects so often. And what Bornet seems to be arguing here is that indulging in curiosities for their own sake, and for Witzige Künste, which is what he calls them here, is often the translation for curiosities, by, even by Luther as well as by others, is not only useless, but immoral at a time of great poverty. The entire framework of his work suggests, however, how the Kunstkammer can be folded into a policy concerning techne, whose ultimate end was the perfecting of the Republic for the sake of all of its citizens, and not for curiosity alone, thus salvaging the Kunstkammer for those patrons who so dearly wanted to have one. In Bornis's chapter on the Kunstkammer, which I have translated on your handout, he makes clear what its use is, both to cultivate the study of global nature and of art, and to declare the magnificence of the prince, itself an important goal in contemporary reason of state. Indeed, he argues that the Kunstkammer was so vital politically that he planned another treatise on the growth of the state, and there he planned to discuss, quote, many and different things, partly naturalia, partly artificialia, antiquities, new things, rarities, etc., and in what way they ought to be distinguished in their classes according to order, so that they may the better display their public magnificence and give glory. So he planned a, um, a work offering an ideal structure for the Kunstkammer. But alas, Bornitz died, and this work never appeared. However, his writings left a mark. The most egregious case, perhaps, is the 1641 treatise by Maximilian Faust of Frankfurt am Main on the treasury. Um, and you can see here, by the way, those three parts of knowledge of the reason of state to found to conserve and to grow, growth being here in the form of lots of gold in the treasury. This is the goal here. <coughs> Faust lifted an entire book of his work, 200 pages, straight from Bornitz's On a Sufficiency of Things Without Any Credit. So the whole section on the mechanical arts comes straight out of Bornitz. But generally, authors were happy to cite Bornitz as an authority. So, for example, the jurist um, Hermann Lather from Schleswig, for instance, cites him over 30 times, noting that princes must take care to celebrate gifted artists and attract them from other polities. He admitted that some arts, like making things extremely tiny, were frivolous. Carving 150 images into a grapeseed had no use. Likewise, those arts that make one effeminate, contrary to mores, should be expelled from the state, according to Lather. However, he immediately backtracks. Human skill and industry was to be praised that allows one to enclose all of Homer's Iliad in a nutshell, he wrote, which would be the prime example of making things tiny. <laughs> Kaspar Klock in Braunschweig Luneburg in his work on the treasury of 1651 continually quotes Bornitz at length as in his list of luxury crafts, which he noted, quote, produce less necessity and utility than a noble pleasure, honestum voluptatum, and delight in their works and instruments. Such are the arts of banqueting, preparing delicacies, bathing, hairdressing, face painting, cosmetics, perfumes, and unguents, Soaps, dyeing garlands and feathers, gold leaf, writing and painting, engraving, sculpture, musical instruments, etc. Clock argued strongly that these arts, along with the rest of the mechanical arts, were vital to the state. Without these arts, no state can survive. He warned that there have been states and cities that have despised manual arts to their very great loss. And after describing the glory of cities such as Nuremberg and Augsburg, which excelled in the mechanical arts, he praised in particular the Kunstkammer, writing, he who is eager to admire the manual arts in a compendium of German acumen, let him request the favor of seeing the Kunstkammer, the Technikotheka 
of Saxony and Dresden, of Wurttemberg and Stuttgart, of Bavaria and Munich, and he will comprehend in a single glance more than he could, could be carefully studied in a full year, and admiringly he will not satisfy his eyes with wonders, nor anywhere grow weary the choice of things to see. In fact, Klopp lifted this passage uh, from elsewhere, from an oration praising Germany by the young Francis Charles of saxe lauenburg in a collection of debates from the noble Collegium Illustre in Tübingen, compiled by Friedrich Achilles, Duke of Württemberg, and dedicated to the emperor. This collection showcased the Latinity and culture achieved by these German princes, who were eager to demonstrate how much they valued learning and the patronage of the arts in particular. There, Francis Charles countered the criticism launched by others that the ingenium of Germans lay in their hands, ignobly. And he celebrated German achievement in the mechanical arts as noble, as illustrated in the institution of the Kunstkammer, and then follows the passage that Klock lifted. This was a prince who thought about the Kunstkammer in the terms of international competition and cultivation of ingenuity at the heart of contemporary political prudence. However, it is interesting to note how the ruler's perspective here differs slightly from those of some of the politicians we've been encountering. At no point does Francis Charles even hint that there might be something frivolous or wasteful about the Kunstkammer. Clock himself, who complained about other courtly excesses, such as drinking, fireworks, and too much travel, seems to have only positive things to say about the Kunstkammer. He praises it elsewhere, for example, as a sign of how princes value those who invent new things, which was very good policy. To conclude, cameralism as a whole has been underappreciated in the history of economic thought. Historians of science and art historians certainly rarely consult early cameralist writings in particular. And these writers discuss the Kunstkammer extensively as a prominent part of court life and one posing particular problems for princely finances. Their mantra was utility, and they rejected arts cast as utterly useless, yet it was surprising how much they could consider useful in some way, whether as a means of broadcasting the power of the prince, of celebrating artists, or as furthering competition and sharpening ingenuity. Bornitz's writings show how the political theory prevalent during the show the political theory prevalent during the Kunstkammer at its height. This is important, I believe, because when Kammerlos thought has been related to the Kunstkammer, it has often been seen as a cause of its demise. In other words, the inventorying of natural goods and emphasis on utility and good order from a later stage of Kammerlosism <coughs> has been seen at work in the reordering of the Kunstkammer in a later period, breaking apart prior playful hybrids and clearly demarcating objects according to the material from which they were made. Bornitz's much earlier viewpoint, however, shows how the seeds of Camero's thinking could in fact be planted in the fertile grounds of the ludic boundary crossing and trickster Kunstkammer. For instance, given his concern with profitability, Bornitz downplayed the importance of precious raw materials. He particularly celebrated those materially mimetic techniques, such as fake jewels, stones, or woods, that to others might have seemed one of the more dubious aspects of Kunstkammer practices. His core ideas about the transformative potential of techne, if managed according to prudence, never left Kammerlist, or indeed economic thinking more broadly, even if the aesthetics of both political writing and the collection did shift over time. Thank you. Opened up an entire new field of uh, consideration, um, which is obviously uh, being rather ignored. Questions? Please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I thought when you got started that you were going to be making the argument about the importance of cameralism on into the university, etc. Um, but then just at the end, what you seem to suggest was in fact a kind of periodization mm -hmm. within the early and late cameralists where this, what you talked about with Bornetz, got lost mm -hmm. or, or there was a change in favor and uh, a much tighter notion of, let's call it, applied learning mm -hmm. taking over and basic learning dropping out. Is that what you're suggesting? The story is complicated, as stories often are. Uh, so yes, there is a shift in capitalism between earlier and later stages, and yes, there is much more emphasis on inventorying the resources of the state and um, kind of a more static sense of order in a later sense of capitalism. This has been overemphasized, however, so a lot of people have um, misunderstood capitalism and some of the reasons it's, it's been off the board. Um, they've understood policy as police, as though it's a police state, and as though this is all about incredibly firm control from uh, an absolute power not aligned for this kind of playful inventiveness that Bornitz is talking about. But even in a later stage of capitalism, there is, in fact, um, 
a great welcoming of figures that we might think of as dubious, such as projectors, of all sorts of plans for um, innovations, um, transformative potential, relationship to alchemy endures through the late 17th, early 18th century um, in Carolus thinking. Um, so that is all still there, but the structures do become more institutionalized. Um, and the format of global writing, writing still becomes more institutionalized. Bornitz is not lost. He's still cited all the way through 18th, the 18th century. Um, but the, the aesthetics of how you write about political theory does change. Thank you. Towards the end of your talk, you mentioned the be careful certain things in the Kunsthammer can cause effeminacy. Yes. What were the objects that were considered dangerous mm -hmm. that way? Um, yeah, that particular quote wasn't about the Kunstkammer, particularly about luxury arts in general. Um, and I think many of the items on the list of luxury arts, such as face painting, um, would be something. So one thing that, uh, the attention to fashion, for example. Um, Bornitz loves fashion. He loves ribbons. He thinks it's incredible the inventiveness of human engineered ribbons and how much profit can be made out of ribbon making. Um, goes on a great length about gloves. Um, so fashion is a huge industry in Carolism, and this, of course, socially speaking, is uh, a problematic issue, especially <coughs> when you have sumptuary laws. There is a big political discourse about how much you should regulate fashion, how much you should um, determine who's allowed to wear what, and what are the political pitfalls of allowing people to buy whatever they want. Either economically, there are advantages. So Bornitz has one of these early ideas about the profits of a domestic economy, of spending money locally, which is not something a lot of camera thinkers have. Um, and so it's great to have people engage in fashion. But for a lot of other people, political thinkers, that goes against good order because you can't easily visually ascertain who you're looking at walking down the street, what part of the political structure they come from. So Lather, for example, as do other people, rails against the idea that um, male and female fashions are becoming interchangeable. That you can hardly tell who's a man and who's a woman anymore. They have these styles for little hats that women were wearing for for example, the period that a lot of people complain about is being too masculine. So that'd be the example of overly masculine. Um, fashion, and one can only imagine that the other fashions of the period that might have seen as overly feminine. Thank you. Did those arguments extend to style and aesthetics at all? Over ornate objects? I have to look for that. Not as far as I can remember. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Uh, one of the other two different things you brought up in your talk. One is the sort of skepticism about acquiring luxury for its own sake within such a collection, and the emblem which showed how sand and ash can be combined to make glass. Um, the background to my title slide was actually of sand. Um, in this, be, uh, with, I've been thinking about for ages, but it goes back to a discussion about value in Kunstkammer. Um, many of the inventories that we have that have been published are, as it were, expurgated, and the non-valuable materials have been cut out as uninteresting. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of these collections include things like mm -hmm. common sand, that's something you would collect within the realm of earths and minerals. Mm -hmm. um, given his skepticism about luxury, his interest in uh, economic productivity, mm -hmm. Within the discussion of the Coops cover, does he leave space for, as it were, common materials that can be made into things that are more valuable? You would think so, but no. Uh, so his discussion about the natural uh, naturalia and the Coops cover are exclusively about wonders. Um, so he does not do that. Uh, you don't know my art does, <laughs> but uh, not Bornitz. Why do you say he's skeptical about luxury, though? Because he does have that one section on Fervitzige Kunste, but it's kind of like a three-paragraph throwaway against 200 pages that is promoting luxury. It, it, simply, you were pointing out the yeah, yeah. Um, skepticism at the end, but... Yeah. Um, so we yeah. talk about further. Yeah. I was wondering, in your passing reference to the hieroglyphic description mm -hmm. or study of metals. Mm -hmm. It comes just in, a, in passing at one point in 
And, um, and that made me think of this conference is all focused on, of course, on this camera on the Germanic. Uh, but of course, uh, Sir Thomas Brown uh -huh. comes immediately to mind, his collection, his thinking, his writing, uh -huh. and so also the connections from outside of the <coughs> Germanic world, you know, and uh, especially in this time of Brexit, I guess. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I was wondering, uh, what is that possible connection? And also, I was wondering about the political dimension in relation to the Reformation mm -hmm. and, and to the religious world right. wars that ravaged mm -hmm. Central Europe in those very years, in mm -hmm. those very decades. Is, is there any way one can talk about the Kurskammer in all these different principalities mm -hmm. in relation to their very different allegiances, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in, uh, at that time? So, uh, Boris is very Lutheran, uh, marries into the medical Horst family, um, uh, prestigious medical dynasty, and um, draws on Luther and other Lutheran writers often. So, undeniably, a Lutheran text, in fact, winds up on the index. Um, however, he also is working all the time across confessional movements um, in the various political contexts in which he works, in the context of the empire. So, um, he is not... It's difficult to draw a distinction uh, between his political thinking across conventional lines. And that is true in general for reason of state. You can see that immediately from the fact that he's drawing so much from Botero. Uh, because it's all about uh, political competition very, very quickly across professional, confessional lines. Um, you see politicians imitating each other's theory. No one wants to be left behind in this arms race to develop the closest <coughs> political prudence possible, precisely because it is the tool that's being used in these conflicts. So because it is being used in these conflicts, it is therefore shared across warring sides. Mm -hmm. So there is very rapid movement in political thinking uh, in this period. I see, speaking to your English example, my book was Anglo-German, goes back and forth between England and Germany because there are very close connections, and particularly between thinking of Ornitz and Bacon. They draw on very similar sources. Both are drawing on Botero, on Pancioroli, both lawyers. They have very similar mindsets, and they develop some of the very same innovations at exactly the same time. I would love to know if they met. Ornitz <laughs> went to travel to England, but I have no evidence that they did. Thank you. Well, on that point, we must uh, be attentive to time. We'll take a short 20-minute um, coffee break, and uh, perhaps we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much.